Hello, Cass Story 4th graders. What a beautiful day it is. Welcome, Mr. Phillips here, Mrs. Phillips's husband, here to read with you Island of the Blue Dolphins, chapters one through three. And I'm excited, we're gonna get started reading today. So after you hear me read, uh, please, as I'm reading, please follow along if you can. And uh, keep your eyes on the words. It'll help you to understand the book a little bit better, to not only read it yourself, but hear me read it. And then there's a little study guide for you. It's got some questions for you. And you're going to write about uh, what do you think it would be like to live on an island? Do you think you'd like, I don't know, would you like to live on an island? I wonder what that's like. Hey, last time we were talking in the introduction, I was talking about sea otters. And I wanted to show you a picture of a sea otter. Here's my low-tech presentation of a sea otter. He's a cute little guy, isn't he? He floats on his back. And I guess what they do is they dive down in the ocean and they get like shellfish, you know, oysters and clams. And they bring them up and they lay on their back and they take a rock and they smash the rock against the shell and break it open and then open it up and, and eat the meat inside. They're kind of cute. My daughter told me that they lay on their backs and hold hands while they're asleep. And I said, oh, come on. And she said, no, it's true. So I had to find a picture and sure enough, there they are. Can you see that? There the sea otters are holding hands. They don't look like they're asleep to me, but there they are holding hands. Anyway, we were talking about um, Russian fur traders and the Aleut people from Alaska working together to get, get these sea otters and sell their pelts and how they work their way down the coast eventually to the Channel Islands where our story takes place. Anyway, let's get right into it, huh? Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 1 by Scott O'Dell. I remember the day the Aleut ship came to our island. At first, it seemed like a small shell afloat on the sea. Then it grew larger and was a gull with folded wings. At last, in the rising sun, it became what it really was, a red ship with two red sails. My brother and I had gone to the head of a canyon that winds down to a little harbor, which is called Coral Cove. We had gone to gather roots that grow there in the spring. My brother, Ramo, was only a little boy, half my age, which was 12. He was small for one who had lived so many suns and moons, but quick as a cricket, also foolish as a cricket when he was excited. For this reason, and because I wanted him to help me gather roots and not go running off, I said nothing about the shell I saw or the gull with folded wings. Is it really a shell or a gull? No, it's a ship. It must be far off in the distance. I went on digging in the brush with my pointed stick as though nothing at all were happening on the sea. Even when I knew for sure that the gull was a ship with two red sails. But Ramo's eyes missed little in the world. They were black like a lizard's and very large and, like the eyes of a lizard, could sometimes look sleepy. This was the time when they saw the most. This was the way he looked now. They were half closed, like those of a lizard lying on a rock, about to flick out its tongue and catch a fly. The sea is smooth, Ramo said. It is a flat stone without any scratches. My brother liked to pretend that one thing was another. The sea is not a stone without scratches, I said. It is water and no waves. To me, it is a blue stone, he said, and far away on the edge of it is a small cloud which sits on the stone. Clouds do not sit on stones or blue ones or black ones or any kind of stones. This one does. Not on the sea, I said. Dolphins sit there and gulls and cormorants and otter and whales too, but not clouds. It is a whale, maybe. Rama was standing on one foot and then the other watching the ship coming, which he did not know was a ship because he had never seen one. I had never seen one either, but I knew how they looked because I had been told. While you gaze at the sea, I said, I dig roots and it is I who will eat them, and you who will not. Ramo began to punch at the earth with his stick, but as the ship came closer, its sails showing red through the morning mist, he kept watching it, acting all the time as if he were not. Have you ever seen a red whale? he asked. Yes, I said, though I never had. 
Those I have seen are gray. You are very young and have not seen everything that swims in the world. Ramo picked up a root and was about to drop it into the basket. Suddenly his mouth opened wide and then closed again. A canoe, he cried, a great one, bigger than all of our canoes together, and red. A canoe or a ship, it did not matter to Ramo. In the very next breath, he tossed the root in the air and was gone, crashing through the brush and shouting as he went. I kept on gathering roots, but my hands trembled as I dug in the earth, for I was more excited than my brother. I knew that it was a ship and there on the sea, and not a big canoe, and that a ship could mean many things. I wanted to drop the stick and run too, but I went on digging roots because they were needed in the village. By the time I'd filled my basket, the Aluit ship had sailed around the wide kelp bed that encloses our island and between the two rocks that guard the coral cove. Word of its coming had already reached, reached the village and Galasat, carrying their weapons, our men sped along the trail which winds down to the shore. Our women were gathering at the edge of the mesa. I made my way through the heavy brush and moving swiftly down the ravine until I came to the sea cliffs. There I crouched on my hands and knees. Below me lay the cove. The tide was out and the sun shone on the white sand of the beach. Half the men from our village stood at the water's edge. The rest were concealed among the rocks at the foot of the trail, ready to attack the intruders, should they prove unfriendly. As I crouched there in the Toyon bushes, trying not to fall over the cliff, trying to keep myself hidden, and yet to see and hear what went on below me, a boat left the ship. Six men with long oars were rowing. Their faces were broad and shining dark hair fell over their eyes. When they came closer, I saw that they had bone ornaments thrust through their noses. Behind them, in the boat, stood a tall man with a yellow beard. I had never seen a Russian before, but my father told me about them, and I wondered, seeing the way he stood with his feet set apart and his fists on his hips, and looked at the little harbor as though it already belonged to him, if he were one of those men from the north whom our people feared. I was certain of it when the boat slid into the shore and he jumped out, shouting as he did so. His voice echoed against the rock walls of the cove. The words were strange, unlike any I had ever heard. Slowly then, he spoke in our tongue. Oh, he can speak their language. I come in peace and wish to parley. That means to trade, do business. I come in peace and wish to parley, he said to the men on the shore. None of them answered, but my father, who was one of those hidden among the rocks, came forward down the sloping beach. He thrust his spear into the sand. I am the chief of Galasat, he said. My name is Chief Chowig. I was surprised that he gave his real name to a stranger. Everyone in our tribe had two names. The real one, which was secret and was seldom used, and one which was common. For if people used your secret name, it becomes worn out and loses its magic. Thus, I was known as Wanapali, which means the girl with the long black hair, although my secret name is Karana. My father's secret name was Chowig. Why he gave it to a stranger, I do not know. The Russian smiled and held up his hand, calling himself Captain Orlov. My father also held up his hand. I could not see his face, but I doubted that he smiled in return. I have come with 40 of my men, said the Russian. I have come to hunt sea otter. We wish to camp on your island while we are hunting. So see, these must be those guys we were talking about. A Russian captain, this was a hundred years after, after Bering discovered the Straits. And there must have been a lot of these captains for years and years and years. And this one's made it all the way down to the Channel Islands. And he's got these Alouette people with him who are helping him. They have bones through their noses. Isn't that crazy? I have come with 40 of my men, and we wish to hunt sea otter. We wish to camp on your island while we are hunting. My father said nothing. 
He was a tall man, though not so tall as Captain Orlov, and he stood with his bare shoulders thrown back, thinking about what the Russian had said. He was in no hurry to reply, because the Ulowitz had come before to hunt otter. That was long in the past, but my father still remembered them. So these, some of these guys had been there before, or, or some of their people had been there before. You remember another hunt? Captain Orlov said when my father was silent. I have heard of it too. It was led by Captain Mitriff, who was a fool and is now dead. The trouble arose because you and your tribe did all the hunting. We hunted, said my father, but the one you call a fool wished us to hunt from one moon to the next, never ceasing. One moon to the next would be a whole month. So somebody like this Orlov guy came in the past, this Mitriff guy, and he made him work 30 days straight. This time, now Captain Orlov is going to say, this time you need to do nothing, Captain Orlov said. My men will hunt and we will divide the catch. One part for you to be paid in goods and two parts for us. The parts must be equal, my father said. Captain Orlov gazed off toward the sea. We can talk of that later when my supplies are safe ashore, he replied. The morning was fair with little wind, yet it was the season of the year when storms could be looked for, so I understood why the Russian wished to move on to our land, or onto our island. It is better to agree now, said my father. Captain Orlov took two long steps away from my father and then turned and faced him. One part to you is fair, since the work is ours, and ours is the risk. My father shook his head. The Russian grasped his beard. Since the sea is not yours, why do I have to give you any part? The sea which surrounds the island of the Blue Dolphins belongs to us, answered my father. He spoke softly, as he did when he was angry. From here to the coast of Santa Barbara, 20 leagues away. No, only that which touches the island and where the otter live. Captain Orlov made a sound in his throat. He looked at our men standing on the beach and toward those who had now come from behind the rocks. He looked at my father and shrugged his shoulders. Suddenly he smiled, showing his long teeth. The parts shall be equal, he said. He said more, but I did not hear it. For at that instant, in my great excitement, I moved a small rock, which clattered down the cliff and fell at his feet. Everyone on the beach looked up. Silently, I left the Tongyang bushes and ran without stopping until I reached the mesa. <clears throat> That's the end of chapter one. <clears throat> so these guys have come, and they're going to come try to hunt sea otter. And the Russian guy said, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll divide it up into three piles. I get two of the piles, you get one of the piles. And her dad, the chief, said, no way, man. We're going to divide it up into two piles. We're going to split it evenly. I take half, you take half. So the captain says, okay, we'll talk about it later. Chapter two, here we go. Captain Orlov and his Alouette hunters moved to the island that morning, making many trips from their ship to the beach of Coral Cove. Since the beach was small and almost flooded when the tide was in, he asked if he could camp on higher ground. This my father agreed to. Perhaps I should tell you about our island, so you'll know how it looks and where our village was and where the Alouettes camped for most of the summer. Our island is two leagues long and one league wide, and if you were standing on one of the hills that rise in the middle of it, you would think it looked like a fish, like a dolphin lying on its side, with its tail pointing toward the sunrise, its nose pointing toward the sunset, and its fin making reefs and rocky ledges along the shore. Whether someone did stand there on the low hills in the days when the earth was new, and because of its shape, called it the Island of the Blue Dolphins, I do not know. Many dolphins live in our seas, and it may be from one of them that the name came. But one way or another, this is what the island was called. Now, the first thing you would notice on our island, I think, is the wind. It blows every day, sometimes from the northwest and sometimes from the east once in a long while out of the south. All the winds except the one from the south are strong, and because of them the hills are polished smooth and the trees are small and twisted, even in the canyon that runs down to Coral Cove. The village at Galasat lay, Galasa lay east of the hills on a small mesa near Coral Cove and a good spring. About half a league to the north is another spring 
and it was a spring is where water comes out of the ground. About a half a league to the north is another spring, and it was there that the Aleuts put up their tent, which were made of skins and were low to the earth, so low that men had to crawl into them on their stomachs. <coughs> At dusk, we could see the glow of their fires. That night, my father warned everyone in the village of Galaas against visiting the camp. The Aleuts come from a country far to the north, he said. Their ways are not ours, nor is their language. They have come to take otter and to give us our share in the goods which they have and which we can use. In this way, we shall profit, but we shall not profit if we try to befriend them. They are people who do not understand friendship. They are not those who were here before, but they are people of the same tribe that caused trouble many years ago. My father's words were obeyed. We did not go to the Alouette camp, and they did not come to our village. But this was not to say that we did not know what they did, what they ate, and in what way they cooked it, how many otter were killed each day, and other things as well. For someone was always watching from the cliffs while they were hunting, or from the ravine when they were in camp. Ramo, for instance, brought news about Captain Orloff. In the morning, when he crawls out of his tent, he sits on a rock and combs his beard until it shines like a comrade's wing. That's a bird. Ramo said, My sister, Ula, who is almost two years older than I, gathered the most curious news of all. She swore that there was an Alouette girl among the hunter. She is dressed in skins just like the men, Ula said, but she wears a fur cap and under the cap, she has thick hair that falls to her waist. No one believed Ula. Everyone laughed at the idea that hunters would bother to bring their wives with them. The Aleuts also watched our village. Otherwise, they would not have known about the good fortune which, which befell us soon after they came. It happened in this way. Early spring is a poor season for fishing. <clears throat> the heavy seas and the winds of winter drive the fish into the deep water where they stay until the weather is settled and where they're hard to catch. <coughs> During this time, the village eats sparingly, mostly from stores of seeds harvested in autumn. Word of our good fortune came on a stormy afternoon brought, brought by Ula, who was never idle. She had gone to a ledge on the eastern part of the island hoping to gather shellfish. She was climbing a cliff and on the way home when she heard a loud noise behind her. At first she didn't see what had caused the noise. She thought that it was the wind echoing through one of the caves and was about to leave when she noticed silvery shapes on the floor of the cove. The shapes moved and she saw it was a school of large white bass, each one as big as she was, pursued by killer whales which prey upon them when the seals are not to be found the bass had tried to escape by swimming toward the shore, <coughs> but in their terror, they had mistaken the depth of the water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. I don't know if you could find, it's kind of interesting. These sea bass, which I guess are really big fish, there was a bunch of them, and there was some killer whales. You know what a killer whale is? An orca, those black and white big mammals, big, big whales. Those killer whales were chasing them, and they were going to eat them. And the sea bass were trying to get away and they were moving the shallower and shallower water and they hit the island and popped right up on some rocks. Well, now they're stuck. They're laying there on the rocks. The killer whales can't get them, but they're stuck on the rocks. Let's see what's going to happen. But in their terror, they had mistaken the depth of the water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. Ulab dropped her basket of shellfish and set out for the village, arriving there so out of breath she could only point in the direction of the shore. The women were cooking supper, but all of them stopped and gathered round, waiting for her to speak. A school of white bass, she finally said. Where? Where? Everyone asked. On the rocks, a dozen of them, perhaps more than a dozen. Before Ulap had finished speaking, we were running towards the shore, hoping we would get there in time that the fish had not flopped back into the sea or that a chance wave had not washed them away. We came to the cliff and looked down. The school of white bass was still on the ledge, glistening in the sun. But since the tide was high and the biggest waves were already lapping at the fish, there was no time to lose. 
One by one, we hauled them out of reach of the tide. Then, two women carrying a single fish, for they were all about the same size and heavy. We lifted them up the cliff and brought them home. There was enough for everyone in our tribe for supper that night and the next. But in the morning, two Aleuts came into the village and asked to speak to my father. You have fish, one of them said. Enough for only my people, my father answered. You have 14 fish, the Aleut said. Seven now because we ate seven. From seven, you can spare two. There are 40 in your camp, my father replied and more than that of us. Besides, you have your own fish, the dried ones that you brought. We tire of that kind, the Aleut said. He was a short man who only came to my father's shoulders, and he had small eyes like black pebbles and a mouth like the edge of a stone knife. The other Uliet looked very much like him. You are hunters, my father said. Go and hunt your own fish, if you are tired of what you are now eating. I have my people to think of. Captain Orloff will hear that you refuse to share the fish. Yes, tell him, my father said, but also why we refuse. The Elliot gr grunted to his companion and the two of them stalked off on their short legs across the sand dunes that lay between the village and the camp. We ate the rest of the white bass that night and there was much rejoicing. But little did we know as we ate and sang and the older men told stories around the fire that our good fortune would soon bring trouble to Galasat. Ooh, something bad is going to happen. Have you ever noticed sometimes at the very end of a chapter, the author, like, you know, puts something out like that. Something's going to happen. You know what that's called? There's a word for it. It's called foreshadowing. I bet you heard that, foreshadowing. It means, you know, something's going to happen. And it's often not good. It's one of those things that keeps you reading, you know? Turns a book into a page turner. You ever heard of a page turner? When you just can't stop turning the pages, it's so good. That's how I feel about this one. Let's read chapter three. Here we go. Chapter three of Island of the Blue Dolphins. The wide beds of kelp which surround our island on three sides come close to the shore and spread out to sea for a distance of a league. In these deep beds, even on days of heavy winds, the Aleuts hunted, and they left the shore at dawn in their skin canoes and did not return until night, towing after them the slain otter. The sea otter, when it is swimming, looks like a seal, but it is really very different. It has a shorter nose than a seal, small webbed feet instead of flippers, and fur that is thicker and much more beautiful. It also is different in other ways. The otter likes to lay on its back in the kelp beds, floating up and down to the motion of the waves, sunning itself or sleeping. They are the most playful animals in the sea. It was these creatures that the Aleowitz hunted for their pelts. From the cliff, I could see the skin canoes darting here and there over the kelp beds, barely skimming the water and the long spears flying like arrows. At dark, the hunters brought their catch to Coral Cove, and there on the beach, the animals were skinned and fleshed. Two men, who also sharpened the spears, did this work, laboring far into the night by the light of seaweed fires. In the morning, the beach would be strewn with carcasses, that's dead animals, and the waves red with blood. Many of our tribe went to the cliffs each night to count the number killed during the day. They counted the dead otter and thought of the beads and the other things that each pelt meant. But I never went to the cove, and whenever I saw the hunters with their long spears skimming over the water, I was angry, for these animals were my friends. It was fun to see them playing or sunning themselves among the kelp. It was more fun than the thought of beads to wear around my neck. This I told my father one morning. There are scarcely a dozen left in the beds around Coral Cove, I said. Before the Elouettes came, there were many. Many still live in other places around the island, he replied, laughing at my foolishness. When the hunters leave, they will come back. There will be none left, I said. The hunters will kill them all. This morning they hunt on the south. Next week they move to another place. The ship is filled with pelts. In another week, 
The Alouettes would be ready to go. I was sure that my father thought that they would leave soon. For two days before, he had sent some of our young men to the beach to build a canoe from a log which had drifted in from the sea. There are no trees on the island, except for the small ones stunted by the wind. When a log came ashore, as happened once in a long time, it was always carried to the village and worked on where a chance wave could not wash it away. That the men were sent to hollow out the log in the cove and to sleep beside it during the night meant that they were there to watch the Aleuits and to give alarm should Captain Orlog try to sail off without paying us for the otter skins. Everyone was afraid he might. So besides the men in the cove who watched the Aleuit ship, others kept watch on the camp. Every hour, someone brought news. Ulop said that the Aleut woman spent a whole afternoon cleaning her skin aprons, which she had not done before when she had been there. Early one morning, Ramos, Ramos said he had just seen Captain Orloff carefully trimming his beard, so it looked the way it did when he first came. The Aleuts who sharpened the long spears stopped this work and gave all their time to skinning the otter, which were brought in at dusk. We in the village of Galasat knew that Captain Orloff and his hunters were getting ready to leave the island. Would he pay us for the otters he had slain, or would he try to sneak away at night? Would our men have to fight for our rightful share? These questions everyone asked while the Aleuts went around about their preparations, everyone except my father, who said nothing, but each night worked on a new spear that he was making. That's the end of chapter three. Well, do you think they're gonna, the Russians and the Aleuts are just gonna sneak off in the middle of the night, not pay the people what they deserve? I guess we'll find out next time. We'll reach, read uh, chapters four, five, and six next time. So until then, adios, my friends.